So, uh, but Nakamoto's protocol uh, initially uh, wanted to solve was kind of very concrete. So the initial motivation was implementing, well, the accounting of, of money transactions. So the initial problem was that Alice wants to transfer some money to Bob, but yeah, somebody has to do the accounting, right? And uh, if you don't want to trust uh, a single entity, uh, then you have to implement such a ledger, as it's called, well, in a distributed manner. And Nakamoto's protocol, as we have seen also in the previous talk, is, uh, is one method to, to, uh, to achieve this. So the, it's not surprising then that uh, people started to think about what, what is actually the service that Bitcoin can export to, to applications, to, to higher level protocols. And so actually what functionality does Bitcoin achieve? So if you want to specify this book here as a, as a, as a functionality, then what does it, what sh how should it look like? So roughly, so what, what you can find in the literature is, is basically that, well, the basic structure of such a ledger functionality, it's, it's a chain of blocks, and each block has some content. So uh, as we have seen, simple transactions, so Alice transfers some money, well, in reality, these are addresses, so it's not really Alice, it's Alice address, source and destination. But also one could think about to have complex contracts in there, so-called smart contracts, and everything is listed in these blocks. Right. So what are the properties that you often hear about? Well, the content is, sorry, the content is provided by anyone right, that submits uh, such a transaction or contract with sufficient fund. Right? So Alice can decide, well, I transfer this money to Bob. She can even say, I have an entire contract that depends on, uh, on the time and, and given that Bob does this, I do that. And uh, well, the second property that one is interested in is that anyone can read this state, so it's public. You can just say what's the state of this ledger and you, you can just see how much money a certain address has. And probably the most uh, interesting property is that uh, even an uh, adversary cannot uh, modify what's already in there. So it's immutable, it's written in stone, what's written in the ledger. And uh, as a third, uh, fourth uh, property, you want to, uh, the, such a ledger functionality is typically connected to a clock to, to reason about uh, the speed, so how much blocks show up over time. And this is uh, typically found in, in the literature, such specification. So why do, do we want such a functionality? Well, it's nice to, to assume it, such that you can design an application around it, and uh, then assume these ideal properties to conclude the security of your application. Right? And it's also nice to have such functionality because you can work in a composable uh, framework and uh, get, kind of assume this as a hybrid functionality and, and, uh, and use it. Well, let me just give uh, one example, so I will quickly go into these two points. So for example, one application that uh, is actually very nice, so briefly the idea for now. Uh, so imagine these people want to compute some MPC protocol, so now, what is uh, the nice thing here? So instead of sending the messages directly to each other, well, they submit something to the ledger functionality. And what they submit is, in each round of this synchronous protocol, they submit their next protocol message, but with, uh, with attached with a fund. And this, this thing here, so this, uh, as I told you before, you can submit entire contracts. This contract says, well, if you behave nicely now, you will get your money back in the next round. So if this uh, protocol message of your current round is correct and doesn't le lead to an abort, for example, then you will receive your money back. Of course, this uh, requires some form of uh, public identifiability, for example, MPC with identifiable abort. This has been, for example, worked out uh, in uh, Kyaya Sedal 
in a recent, uh, in a recent work. And so dishonest behavior is kind of punished and honest behavior is uh, encouraged. So even worse for, for Eve, if this protocol message that you submitted before led to an abort, she will be identified and not receive her money back. And even worse for her and even better for the honest guys, they will really receive kind of her, her, her deposit. And this uh, uh, kind of uh, favors honest behavior. So let me quickly go into the, the second point. So why, so we would like to have a functionality to, to use to follow this modular approach. So we, we quickly discussed before this number two here, namely that we assume a ledger functionality and create an application. But we also need the first step. So how do we get the latch functionality? And they should rather be the same. So what we assumed here should be one that we can actually get. For example, from a random oracle, and a clock, and a network. And this is the problem which we address in this talk. So they should be the same, otherwise we have a mismatch and cannot really use it. So what are two strong properties that appeared? Well, an over-idealization of Bitcoin was, for example, that uh, all submitted transaction would make it to the next block. That's uh, in the case of an almighty adversary. This cannot, uh, this cannot uh, hold. So the lecture state extends in fixed time intervals. Under the influence of an attacker, this can also not really be. Third, that everyone sees the same state, as one would maybe intuitively think, can also not be guaranteed. Maybe they see a similar state, but one sees maybe a prefix of the other, but not everyone sees the same state. And what we also have to consider is what is the, the influence of an adversary? We have to allow the adversary to influence the ledger and how it behaves more than, for example, just that he can create own transactions or permute the list of transactions. So the roadmap for the rest of, of this talk is we would like to define a ledger functionality which is realizable by the Bitcoin backbone protocol. The questions we have to consider, so important questions, are, for example, so which transactions are part of the next block? Or when is the next block inserted into the state? Which part of the state do honest parties see, and what is the adversarial influence on the state itself? These are the questions we will answer uh, in the following. So let's start now with the description of the lecture functionality that we define in the paper. So first of all, parties can input values. Well, think of transactions. And they are, they run through a so-called validate predicate and are inserted into a buffer. Here, validate is a lecture-specific validation check. Think of does Alice have sufficient fund to transfer this money to Bob? Yeah. So validate gets as input, for example, the, the state of the ledger, the transaction, and decides, is this transaction valid? If yes, it goes into the buffer and stays there now for a while. So let's uh, jump to, a, to the more interesting setting, state updates. So, as I said before, the ledger does not just pre uh, proceed by, himself, uh, by itself. There has to be some influence that the adversary uh, can have on, on this update. So how do we model that? So there is Eve. Well, she can propose the next block. So this sounds now a bit too, too much, right? So it's, it's just a proposal. And this proposal it's not, this is not the next block that goes into the state. It will be, uh, it will be run again for a ledger-specific uh, 
pre uh, procedure, which we call extend policy. So what is extend policy? So this next block proposal is evaluated if it uh, complies with the standards, with the policy that the ledger defines. So this is a ledger-specific parameter and at the same time a compliance enforcing mechanism. So this uh, blueprint, so to speak, what you see here, is a very general class of ledgers that you can now instantiate by giving concrete procedures, for example, policy and validate. For example, in Bitcoin, uh, so, let's, uh, so let's discuss Bitcoin. So uh, to recall, the input to extend policy is the next block, so the proposal of the adversary, the buffer, the, uh, the time, for example, and it produces a next block. The invariant of this extend policy procedure is that if the adversary complies with the standards or with the policy of the ledger, then this ne the, its proposal is really the next block that goes into the state. And if it doesn't comply with the policy of the ledger, this extend policy will enforce the default block going to the next state. And this default block will, of course, uh, be compliant with the, with the policy. So in Bitcoin, this will remind you of, of the channel of the properties that uh, have appeared in the literature. So the extend policy of Bitcoin can say, well, we enforce a minimal chain growth. So if the adversary uh, says, well, don't extend the chain, then at some point extend policy starts producing blocks on its own. We can enforce chain quality, for example, uh, so, which means that not too many blocks uh, can have uh, as their owner uh, a dishonest party, for example. And we can also enforce a weak transaction liveness, which means that all transactions that wait in the buffer for too long, well, they are enforced to go into the next state block. And uh, hence, we have some weak transaction liveness, which can be amplified, for example, by by adding signatures to you in the paper. So let's continue to the, to the third question. So what state, uh, what, which part of the state do honest parties actually see? So when Alice wants to read the state of the ledger, I told you before that it's, a, it's kind of too strong that she just gets the entire state to see. So what is the influence of the adversary there? The adversary can, when uh, Alice wants to read the state, uh, Eve can define a pointer into this state here with the effect that Alice gets this prefix of the state. So this again seems a bit too strong, so there is a restriction on how this pointer here can be defined. The restriction is that this pointer cannot be too far away from the head of the state, and it can only move forward. That's all. So if Alice reads the state, she will get some prefix of the state, which she's, uh, she can be sure that it's not, you know, the state is not much longer than what she can see, and she will only see increasing sequences. And uh, let me mention a last uh, point. So uh, I also said that the ledger doesn't just proceed alone. What is also important is uh, in, a, in, a, in a framework like uh, UC is that a functionality has to receive activations to work. Right? So there are special, in the, in the ideal world, there are special, let's say, dummy inputs, dummy commands, which we call uh, maintain ledger. And whether the ledger proceeds in terms of time, so in terms of this clock functionality, also depends on the number of queries it can get. And if you get uh, only a few queries, it, it proceeds lower than uh, if you get a lot of queries. And so the punchline here is that the ledger functionality itself, depending on the activations it gets, can influence the, the speed of this clock. 
So to sum up, this is the blueprint of the ledger functionality we put forward in our paper. We have modeled the influence of the adversary. And the parties, they can submit inputs, they can read the state, and they are assured that whatever they read, this points into a window that's not too, too wide and starts at the, at the head of the state. And they, so this blue arrow means that Alice can read up to here, and so on. And this window now slides, so as the, as the state extends, through the extent uh, mechanism I explained before. The parties move, kind of move with this window, and this gives a kind of a sliding window view on this, on this blockchain model. Yeah. So that's kind of the summary of, of our ledger functionality. So how do we realize that? So the usual suspects here, we assume a couple of hybrid functionalities. A clock, of course, uh, the random oracle, and a diffusion network. So it's, a, it's not a broadcast network, it's kind of a, an ad hoc network where you can implement a uh, multicast on top of it. And so what we then first did is to, to cast the backbone protocol as a synchronous UC protocol, following uh, the synchrony model uh, by Katz et al. And uh, so, in a nutshell, so the protocol proceeds in rounds. And in each round, you have to do this proof of work step. And you have to fetch the information, so what's the longest chain, what transactions came up, and so on. So we divided each round into two mini rounds to reflect this logical structure. So the mining protocol is, is roughly the protocol you saw in the, in the previous talk. So in the first mini round, you fetch all new information from the network, new transactions, longest chain, and so on. In the second mini round, you try to extend your local longest chain. And if you found a longer chain, if you could extend it, then you, uh, you multicast this again over the network. At any time, Remember we, that we want to realize such a ledger functionality, so the ledger state that the parties implement is defined to be the prefix of the longest local chain here. So and then the main theorem, of course, again, depends on, uh, on, the, on some parameters that we saw before, so we, we are in a setting with a fixed difficulty. You have the probability that you find a kind of a that you, that you find a proof of work. You have the network delay. You have to quantify the honest uh, mining power and the dishonest mining power. Roughly, the, the honest mining power is quantified as the probability that at least uh, one honest guy uh, finds a proof of work in some round. And the dishonest uh, 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 mining power is quantified as the expected value of number of proof of works that the adversary can find uh, in one round. Then we can state the main theorem. So if, the, if this uh, honest mining power and the dishonest mining power uh, are apart, so which means uh, the beta here is, is sufficiently bounded away from alpha and alpha is larger uh, according to this formula, then this mining protocol, right, the synchronous you see, uh, ledger protocol with the concrete extend policy for Bitcoin, for the Bitcoin backbone, uh, realizes this ledger functionality that we explained before, where you define the ledger state as the prefix of the longest local chain. So one nice thing in this uh, proof is that uh, kind of the proof of work step could be kind of distilled out as a modular, modular uh, sub-step. So the proof of work step, so we, it's, the first thing is to create kind of a UC functionality that resembles a lottery. So what does this mean? So, every, so this lottery that the proof of work step implements, it's kind of very easy. Each, one, each party can submit uh, inputs, and the lottery throws some coins, 
And if it's accepted, then it's, in, it, then it's stored in the pool of accepted inputs. That's already it for this uh, lottery functionality. And the nice observation is then that under these assumptions of the theorem, uh, the honest parties have uh, an advantage in winning this lottery over the dishonest parties. And this finally then leads to, to the consensus we, we already know about Bitcoin. So to, uh, to sum up, so we have seen that uh, kind of if you define such, if you assume a ledger functionality for your application, you should not over-idealize what Bitcoin achieves. And what we now provided is uh, an implementable ledger, so we specified a kind of a general class of ledgers and showed how, which concrete one bit, the Bitcoin backbone protocol can realize. And this realizable ledger can now be used as the basis for proving applications. It can also be used as further, uh, as a basis for further analysis itself, for example, a rational analysis. And, uh, and this uh, kind of extends what we already knew about Bitcoin. So we had property-based uh, uh, definitions and then proofs. Now we also know kind of which functionality in a composable framework you can assume uh, in, a, in a large application. So this concludes my talk and thank you for your attention. <laughs>